Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. I want to greet each and every one of us that is viewing. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. And, you know, we want to thank you for streaming tonight. You know, and we just want to share a little word with us. You know, something that has been on my spirit in recent times. As recent as Friday. And, and you know, I just want to share, you know, with us. You know, this is our first Bible study for the year 2021. You know, but God is a good God. Amen. I, I, I greet you again. In Jesus' name. Before we proceed, I, you know, just like to pray. Just bow your heads as I pray. Father, we want to thank you again for your mercies and we want to thank you for your blessings upon our lives. We thank you for being our Lord, our God, and our Savior. Lord, here we are tonight again in 2021, a new year, Lord Jesus. A year, God, which brings us closer to your coming. We pray tonight that as we get into the word, that the word as it go, goes forth will shape lives, that it will change lives, and that, Lord, it will accomplish that you will. We pray, mighty God, that when all is said and done tonight, that your perfect will might be done. We ask, God, that you have your way and that you take full control in the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless the Lord again. Again, you know, I greet you. I salute all who are streaming online, whether you're in Jamaica, whether you're in the US of A, whether you're in Canada, or wherever you are in this world. You know, we greet you. We bid God blessing upon your life. And, we, you know, we just pray that you will find yourself operating, you know, as God would have you to operate. You know, it's important that we... Try to love the Lord with all our heart, with all our might, with all our strength. You know, and we just want at the end of the day to, to live a healthy Christian life and to be able to hear from him when he comes. Well done, though good and faithful servant. I don't know about you tonight, but, you know, my desire is just to continue to live for him. And continue to serve him. I would like to draw our attention to two passages of scripture. Um, taken from first of all Genesis chapter 15. And we'll be reading from verse 1 through to verse 6. Genesis chapter 15. After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying. Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord, God, what will thou give me, seeing that I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliza of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he shall come forth out of thine own bowels, shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and said, Look now towards heaven, and tell the stars if they be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Again, if we look at Genesis chapter 16, 1 through to 6, we just read the first passage. First passage tells us that the Lord promised Abraham a seed. And here in Chapter 16, 1 through to 6. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, bear him no children. 
And she had an handmaid, an Egyptian whose name was Agar. And Sarai said unto Abram, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened unto the voice of Sarai. And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. And Sarai said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. I have given my maid in thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. And the Lord judged between me and thee. But Abraham said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dwelt, dealt hardly with her, she fled from the face of her mistress. Amen. Praise God. I would like to, you know, as we talk tonight, if I should probably put a theme or topic, you know, I would like to say finding and abiding in the will of God. You know, it's extremely important. Sometimes we talk about the will of God. Um, folks sometimes just think that, you know, we're just talking about something trivial. Um, we can go about living our own lives and doing the things that we want to do without considering the will of God. I am here tonight with a burden. I'm here tonight feeling heavy in my spirit as it pertains to the people of God finding and abiding in the will of God. You know, I, I think that sometimes we go through some circumstances, some situations, some, some trying times because we did not find the mind of God. We did not seek the will of God. We did not ask God, what is the plan that you have for my life? Because if you know the plan of God for your life, then you will know the will of God for your life. So sometimes we do not ask God, what is your will for my life? How is it that you want me to move? What is it that you want me to do? And then when we move without consulting God, you find yourself in situations that sometimes are not welcome. And I, under the Holy Ghost to, tonight, would like to share with us from the word of God so that as the people of God, we can understand that God has a will for us. And he, in turn, wants us to walk in his will. You know, from, from last Friday, you know, there's just this thought about the will and abiding in the will of God. And uh, it, it's just a burden. You know, and I was just thinking that, you know, it's soon my time to teach Sunday school. You know, so I want to, you know, and then, but here am I tonight talking to us about finding and abiding in the will of God. Sunday night before I went to bed, I looked on something as it pertains to the will of God. Monday when I got up, went to work, my sister in Christ called me. And after the greeting, remember now, the only thing we said was, bless the Lord, how are you? You know, all the best for the new year. And after the greeting was over, the first thing that came out of her mouth, 
There is always a waiting period as it pertains to the will of God. I'm going to say, yes, sister. Now, the last time we spoke was last year, you know, even though the year just started. And this was the first time we're talking. And the first thing after greeting she uttered, there is a waiting period as it pertains to the will of God. And that was the last thing that I looked on before I went to bed Sunday night. Then, when we had our Bible reading Monday night, and we were ready to pray. Now, in, in my house, we do not set a rostra to say, you should be in charge tonight for the prayer session. But we go as the Lord bids us. And my eldest son, Brian, he said, let us pray that as people of God, we abide in the will of God. Can you imagine the very same thing that is in my spirit? I didn't share with him, you know. Didn't share anything at all with him. The very same that thing that was in my spirit. In one day, two individuals mentioned the same thing. Yesterday, while I was at work, And I have never listened in full the high at a dream speech. So I was in my office and the radio was playing on the outside. The television was playing because my office is near um, a, 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 a relaxed station, so to speak. And the speech was playing. And could you believe that a part of the speech the man was saying, Martin Luther King was saying, I am not worried the only thing that I am worried about is being in the will of God. <laughs> I was amazed because this is a speech from a very long time. And in my spirit was the will of God, talking about the will of God, for, for the people of God to abide in the will of God. And here is a speech. So Monday it happened two times. And yesterday, again, the, 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 on the television, the speech was playing. And this man said that there's only one thing that he is worried about, you know, and it's about being in the will of God. I would like to just share with us, you know, what is in my spirit, you know, about abiding, finding, and abiding in the will of God. I know that 2020 was a hard year for certain individuals, for some. Some have testified that even though it was a time of COVID, a time of panic, and a time of lockdown, they have testified that, you know, God is good and that, you know, they receive blessings throughout the year. But this is not so for all of the saints. For some saints, it has, last year was a really, really rough year. And now we are in 2021 and nothing has changed. The year is still, uh, it started rough for some folks. And, you know, folks, saints of God in the church, you know, really, you know, find it hard. And I'm just talking out of a burden, not that I know of situation as it pertains to saints. But I'm just talking about what I'm feeling in my spirit. I know that there are, Folks, there are saints that has find it difficult. And they find it difficult to share what they are going through, what they are going through some of the times. Even right now, they just don't want to tell anybody. Because it is so rough. And some folks, saints I'm talking about, are at the point of frustration. Because they don't know what to do. They pray, they fast, and there is still no change. They are in, out of 2020 into 2021, and they are still going through a rough time. But I want to tell us that we are in a time right now where 
we have got to be determined. We have got to be resolute in our minds that comes what may, we are going to rely on the grace and on the mercies of the Lord to take us through. If we are not aware, we are living in a time right now where we have got to be totally reliant on the mercies and the grace of God to take us through. If we love the Lord and if we consider his will important, we are going to have to know and we are going to have to understand that there are going to be tough times. And it's only by the mercies of God that we are going to be able to stand up and say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. It is by the mercies of God that we are going to put down some things. We are going to push some things aside, even when that thing is before us. And we can take that thing. We can say that thing and get ourselves out of the situation. Knowing that we are in the will of God and we, we are going to it, we have got to rely on the grace and the mercies of God you know, to take us through. There is a fear in, in, in my life. There is a fear that I operate with. And this fear is a holy respect for God. A holy respect to say that, Lord, whatever I do, I want to make sure that I am in your will. There is a fear that we should operate with as saints, as children of God. There is a fear that we should walk with. And this fear, like I said, is that holy respect. Respect to make sure that whatever we do, whatever decisions we make, and very important, and as we get down, we will go into us making decisions. Whatever decision we make, that these decisions, these steps are aligned to the will and purpose of God for our lives. But I'm burdened today because I feel that there are saints who are at the brink of stepping out of God's will for their life. And I want to encourage us, even as I pass, to encourage you are at that point where you know that if you make that move, you will be stepping out of the will of God. I want to encourage you right now not to step outside of the will of God, but just remain humble, remain abiding in the will of God. And before long, God will work it out for you. So there is a fear that we should operate with. And this fear is a holy respect. One that will cause us to walk according to the perfect will of God. I just feel in my spirit that though there is a part that is made known to some of us, we are not determined to walk this path. At times it might be difficult. But if we are going to please the Lord with our every move, and if we are going to identify ourselves with the Lord and abide in his will, the will that he has for our life, then this holy respect must be a code by which we operate with. The Bible in Proverbs 9 verses 11 So we are saying that we must operate in the will of God. But the Bible in Proverbs 9, 9 through to 11, it reads thus. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. 
Oh, glory. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge, glory to God, the knowledge of the, whole, the holy is understanding. For by me that thy day shall be multiplied and the years of thy life shall be increased. This fear that is mentioned in verse 10 means morally reverence or this holy respect that I am talking about. This fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It is like a spring that is at the beginning of a stream. The fear of the Lord produces wisdom like a fuel that keeps an engine going. I believe that if you put wisdom under the microscope and it has the same genetic code as the fear of the Lord, this wisdom which come out of fearing God will generate, will cause, will create wise choices and habits in us as individuals. The Bible in Proverbs says, by this wisdom, we will, our years will be multiplied. Your days will be multiplied and your years of life shall be increased. By this wisdom, this wisdom that is the fear of the Lord, that caused now us to walk according to his will. Our days will be multiplied. And our years shall increase. Oh Jesus. If we walk according to the will of God. If we, look here, there is a blessing, there, there is a blessing if we walk according to the will of God. I remember years ago when I, when I, when I sought the Lord about a particular thing. And, and there was this acquaintance of mine. And as we discussed, you know, I, I told her that, you know, this was not the will of God for my life. And she, she said, but what if, but what if you neglect and still go because all things work together for good to them that love the Lord? And to them who are called according to his purpose. But what if you go, won't it still work? God, God will just still work it out for your good. Yes, he, he, he could work it out for my good. But I know that there are always repercussions. And I don't want to face those repercussions. I rather to do the will of God. God reveal it to me. I, I want to, to do it. So it is true, this wisdom, the Bible said, that your days will be multiplied. Can you imagine by doing and abiding in the will of God, your years will increase? It is true, this wisdom, we will have less struggles like, a, like when, I, when I opened, I said that some of the struggles that we have are directly related to us going against the will of God. And it is the same God that we know go to and say, God, fix this thing for me. But when we were making the move, God was prompting us. God was, 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 was preaching us. And he was saying, look here, don't do that thing. Don't make that move. Don't invest there. And we still went outside of the will of God. And now we are saying to God, fix it. When we make wise choices and abide in the will of the Lord, 
our struggles will be less. As a matter of fact, we will only be dealing with blessing that comes by abiding in the will of God and will not have to deal with the repercussions that come with going outside of God's will for your life. What is the will of God? That is the question. So people often ask, what is the will of God? Or what is the will of God for my life? What is the will of God for our life? It is not easy to define in one single sentence what is the will of God. For sure, one of the team echoed in scriptures in one way or another, is the will of God. God's will is vast, sorry, as an entire plane of creation, and it seems to be settled and unchanging. Both the Old and the New Testament writers refers to God's will as a broad blueprint. But in practical application, it is expressed in specific terms. Specific terms as it to you and me. Specific terms as it pertains to us as an assembly. Specific terms as in what is the next move that God would have you to do. God's will can also be viewed from his active side as his conscious deciding will and choosing to do something. The affirmation that there exists with God a will that is resolute and bears on his action and the life of his people is made in all parts of the Old Testament. The impression created is, in, is that he has worked continuously to interact with his creation according to a design plan. The Bible in Psalms 156 verses 6 announces that the Lord does whatever he pleases him. He will also, he will also a pattern be followed in life by his people. To define the will of God in a way that all members tonight, all members viewing tonight can understand. I would put it to us this way. The will of God includes everything that God desires or wishes to happen in earth and in heaven. Or in heaven and in earth. As a result, he has planned what he wishes to occur. For example, in the first part of the Lord's Prayer that is taken from Matthew 6, 9 to 10, in the first part of the Lord's Prayer, found in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches us to pray that the Father's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6, 9 to 10. He said, pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. The word for will Give us this day our daily bread. The word for will in this passage is thelma. The word means what one wishes to or has determined will happen. That is, we are to want God to have his wish, his will, and his plan fulfilled. It therefore means That my life, your life, the plans that we have, 
should agree with his plans. A typical illustration of God's plan would be found in this. When some people think about the will of God, they fear that God has already decided every little detail of their life. But this is not so. Yes, he has a plan for us. Jeremiah 29, verses 11. It says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. So he has planned it. But he has not already decided everything as it pertains to your life. If God did this, then we all would be saved. If God operated like this, then we would not walk contrary to his will. So though God is in control of our lives, it is he that determines the number of our years. If the time that is allotted to us is 40 years, our three score and 10 years, they are already determined. However, within these 40 years, within these three score and 10 years, you will realize that God gives us a lot of freedom. He gives us a lot of room to operate according to our own will. God will never mess with free will. And what God wants you to do as it pertains to abiding in his will is to make the decision. Make the decision to abide in his will. Your free will means much to God. Your decision to say, Lord, show me your will. I want to do your will means much to God. And it means much to you also. So God's will then is like a road. He cares if you are on the right side or if you are on the left side. He cares if you are walking down the middle of that road. He cares if you jump, skip, jog on that road. He cares if you are singing while you're going down that road. Or if your face is made up. And he will care the more. Because the Bible tells us that he left the 90 and 9 and and. and, and Go in search of that one. He will care even more if you come off that road. Each of us has a different road to travel. But we are going to the same place. So the road that I travel is not the road that you travel. We come to the same church. We serve in the same God. But the things that I go through are different from what you go through. Each of us have a different road to travel. But yet, we are going to the same place. How are we going to get to this place? By finding and abiding in the will of God. God has a design for your life. He has a plan for your life. And he wants to execute it. In his mind, it is already done. The rest now is up to you, it's up to me to say, Lord, what can I do to be in your perfect will? The road, this road that I talk about is God's will for your life. The road will have twists and have turned on it. It will take you on the mountaintop. And it will take you in the valley. But God has this design for your life. He has this road that is set already for you to traverse. 
and he wants you to walk this road according to his will. Like I said, he is concerned whether you walk on the left, he's concerned whether you walk on the right, he's concerned if you book your toe, he is concerned about everything that it pertains to your life. This big God is concerned about the minutest of things as it pertains to your life. And believe it or not, he has planned before hand that this is how he wants you to navigate the road. But he leave it up to you to say, Lord, show me your will. Lord, tell me what is it that you want me to do. Lord, tell me if you want me to go left, ah, Jesus, or if you want me to go right. So when we look at the story of Abraham, the story that we read, we probably all of us would have heard about Abraham in some form or another. Most of us have heard the story about Abraham, the narrative of Abraham and Sarah in Genesis in revolves around the theme of descendants and land. So when God came to Abraham, he promised him a seed and he promised him land. Abraham is commanded by God to depart from the house of his father, Terah, and move to the land formerly given to the Canaan, Canaanites, but which God now promised to Abraham and his offspring. In Genesis 12, 1 through to verse 4, very familiar passage of scripture, God tells Abraham to depart his homeland for a land that he would show him. Making him a great nation. Bless him. Make his name great. Bless those who bless him and curse those who curse him. Obeying God's call, Abraham brought his wife, his nephew Lot, and the wealth that they had acquired and travel to this place that God said, come, I am going to take you to a place. And that place I will give to your seed. I believe that Abraham moved. He, he believed God. The Bible said that because he believed God, it was counted unto him for righteousness. He wanted to receive the blessing. He wanted an offspring of his own lines and this was promised unto him yes he was interest, interested in the land but I believe that he was more concerned about the offspring and God made him a promise and Abraham by faith left the land that where his household was and he went to a place that God said, I will show you that place. In Genesis 15, verses 2 to 6, and we'll be reading it again. Genesis 15, 2 to 6. The Bible says, When God appeared unto Abraham in a dream, Abraham's concern was about him being childless. And Abraham said, Lord God, what will thou give me seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house, this Eliza of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine here. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine here, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be in 
than here. So in verse 4 to verse 6, God moved now to re-emphasize the promise. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine here, but that shall come forth out of thine own bowl shall be thine here. And look what, look what he did now in verse 5. And he brought him from abroad and said, Look now towards the heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So this promise, or this will of God, remember our definition? The will of God includes everything that God desires or wishes to happen. So this will of God was now revealed to Abraham as it pertains to him being a father of many nations. As it pertains to the seed of the promise coming from the lines of Abraham. But as we jump down into Genesis chapter 16, so God made Abraham a promise. He said, look here, in Genesis chapter 12, he said, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless them that bless you. I'm going to curse them that curse you. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Abraham took this. Abraham now went to the place that God said that he will take him. He was there a number of years past. No son. And in his mind, he must have been saying, if it was me in my mind, I would have been saying, God, a certain time has elapsed, and you promised me that you were going to give me a son. And I have no son. Remember, you know, I told you, if you look at the scripture, you will recognize that one of the things that God threw in there was that, I am going to give you a seed. Which tells me that even before God made a promise, God knew what was in his heart. God knew that one of the things that he longed for was a seed. And he followed God. So here in Genesis chapter 16, 2 to 6. And Sarai said unto Abraham, Abraham, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing, I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain ch children by her. And Abraham hearkened unto the voice of Sarai. And Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Agar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband, and Abraham to, her, to Abraham to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. Probably next week we'll talk about that word, despise. And you're going to find out that the Bible might put it a soft way, but there was argument in the house because of this child. They were, Abraham got to the point where he couldn't take the nagging anymore. And he said to Sarah, what she's in your hand, do what you please. Him get fed up now of the nagging.
Verse 5, And Sarah said unto Abraham, My wrong be upon thee. I give my maid into thy bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised. The word came up again, you know, in her eyes. The Lord judge between me and is swearing no go on, you know. The Lord judge between me and thee. But Abraham said unto Sarai, Behold, thy maid is in thy hand. Do to her as it pleaseth thee. And when Sarai dealt hardly with her, she fled from her face. This tells us that something was building up, you know. So Abraham and his wife went out of God's will and it brought forth the son of a bond woman. Now some folks would argue that Abraham did not knew God's will in its entirety for himself and his wife. It was not until Genesis, and we are going to look at Genesis 17, 16. It was not until Genesis that the Lord really told Abraham that the child would be of him and of his wife, Sarah. Genesis 17. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Now this was the first time that it was mentioned that this son would be of his wife. God told him, you know, that look here. I am going to give you a son. I'm going to give you a heir. But this was the first time in scripture that it was no mention that the child should come from the womb of Sarah. I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nation. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And said in his heart, shall a child be born unto me, unto him, that is an hundred years old? And Sarah, that is ninety years old? And Abraham said unto God, Ho, oh, that thou might live before, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah, thy wife, Abraham was now pleading to say, look here, this child that I have with the man woman, just let this child live before you. Let this child be now the one that you will now establish your covenant with. Let this child be the, 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 the promised child. But God said, no, Sarah, thy wife, shall bear thee a son. Indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant with his seed after him. Amen. Also in Genesis 18, verses 9, the scripture went on in Genesis 18 because even after this, there was still no child. And God, again, when the angels appeared before him, when they came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, they said unto him, Where is thy wife, Sarah? And he said, Behold, in the tent. 
And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. And if you go down further in the scripture, you'll see where Sarah also laughed. Was it that Abraham did not know the will of God in its entirety? Or did he for a moment walk out of God's perfect will for his life? I want us to understand, and I mentioned the scripture earlier on, that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. I want us also to understand that even when we go wrong, God is able to turn that around and let it be a part of his will. But that does not say that we did not go outside of God's perfect will for our life. Remember, Abraham plead with God and said, God, let this son Ishmael be the one that you establish your covenant with. Let him be the one. And God said, no. So this son that God was talking about from Genesis 12 and in Genesis chapter 15, was Isaac. But this son Ishmael came as a result of Abraham going outside of the perfect will of God. Mark you. God promised Abraham, and, and, and this is how great our God is, you know. God promised Abraham that, look here, your, you shall be the father of many nations, and your seed shall be innumerable. When Agar fled from Sarah and the angel met her, the angel said, go back to Sarah, humble yourself, and you shall have a son and you shall call his name Ishmael. And he will be great. So even though this man was not the heir. This man, God was not willing to establish the covenant with him. Because God made that promise to Abraham. God caused it that this son Ishmael was blessed. But Abraham went outside of the perfect will of God. And in his house, from the scriptures that we read earlier on, you recognize that there was a tussle between him and his wife. And he now said to his wife, do as you will. Sarah was so angry that when she dealt with Hagar, Hagar run, leave the house. It took an angel of God to say, look here, go back and humble yourself. It is important, brothers and sisters, it is important, saints of God, that when we know the will of God, we, we, we abide in the will of God. If, if God tells us his will, but we are not certain, it's important then that we talk to God. It's important then that we say to God, Lord, you, you know you tell me this, but guess what happened? I need you to, to tell me a little bit more. Hallelujah. I need you to tell, I need you to, to show me something. I am not going to move, oh glory to God, until I know that you have said move. Abraham, listen to this. The Bible referred to Abraham as a friend of God.
A friend will reveal things to a friend. But Abraham took the counsel of his wife and went in unto Agar. And there was trouble in his house. I started out by saying to the saints of God that sometimes we have trouble in our house. Sometimes we go through some things and we are wondering what is happening. Not recognizing that we went out of the will of God. And what we are experiencing, experiencing is as a result of us going outside of God's will for our life. I want us to understand. That as it pertains to the will of God, oh Jesus, that we must endeavor to abide, find it, and abide in it. Extremely important. So what is it that we can learn from looking at the story? I believe that in the minutest of things, God, as it pertains to us as individuals, has a particular way. Uh, he has a particular part for us to chart. He has a particular door that he wants us to go through. If we do it according to his will, then we will be abiding in his will. But if we go outside of his will, then we will go against what God desires for us. I would rather to deny myself. And I'm talking so no, you know. I'm teaching so I must talk so no. I would rather to de deny myself certain things and make sure that I am in the perfect will of God for my life. From a young Christian, this is a fear that I operate with. I want, look here, and I am not perfect. Abraham was a friend of God and he went outside of the perfect will of God. I am a man and I am not perfect. And there are many times when I went outside of God's will for my life. Many times. But it is important, brothers and sisters. And it is for our own benefit that we try our endeavor best to abide in the will of God for our life. There is no perfect man. We all make mistakes and at times operate outside of what God wants us to do. However, we should as much as possible and as best as possible try to do his will. So what is it that we can learn? The first thing is always seek to know God's will for our life. So as I was saying to us that Abraham, he knew that, that, that a seed should come. And if he was not so clear on it, he should have gone back to God and said to God, you know, you tell me that a seed will come. But is it from the womb of Sarah? Or should I take Sarah's made and the son will come the scripture did not mention it but i believe that he he followed the counsel of his wife without finding the will of god as it pertains to that aspect of his life always seek to know god's will for your life seeking and knowing god's will for our life starts with us believing that he has a plan 
for our life. We mentioned the scripture earlier on from Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. Thoughts to give you an expected end. In Philippians 2, verses 8, and then 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 18, the Bible says, For it is God which worketh in you both to what? To will and to do of his good pleasures. And, and as I mentioned the scripture in Philippians, and then I'm going to mention the, the other one in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. These scriptures, as it pertains to the will of God, is now talking about persons that are trying their best to walk according to God's will for their life. The Bible says, that is he which worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Then in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 18. He says, in everything, hallelujah, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. God's will for our life has reason. God's will for our life has purpose. If we are interested in knowing God's plan, God's will for our life, we must learn to walk with God and develop a relationship with him. By now we know that developing a relationship with him comes by us reading the word, come by us praying, fasting, comes by us meditating. And it comes by us being involved in ministry. When you seek these disciplines in your life, God will begin the first step by revealing his will to us. Many times when we say we are seeking God's will, we just say that to satisfy our consciences. But our mind is already made up. Oftentimes before we go to God, and say, Lord, I want to do this thing. Lord, I want to study. I want to migrate. I want a, a husband or I want a wife. Our minds are already made up. So when we go to God now, we are saying, God, I made this decision, you know, and I, I, I want it to be in your will. So just, 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 just stamp it for me. Just put your seal of approval on it for me. So that I can know that I am in your will. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell us that this is not an effective way to find the will of God as it pertains to our lives. It is not an effective way to find the will of God as it pertains to our life. You will be more confused than anything because your heart is saying one thing. But your spirit, God is tugging on you and saying no. And you will find yourself being more confused and more frustrated than anything. Because your mind is made up 
And now you are waiting for God to put a seal of approval on this thing. Before God begins to reveal his will to you, you must be committed to doing whatever it is that he desires you to do. I have this in bold and in red in my document. Before God begins to reveal his will to you, so before you go to God and say, God, put a seal of approval on this, you must be committed to doing whatever it is that he wants you to do or that he desires you to do. So you have to know, go to God and say, God, look here. I want a house, but I need you to tell me the neighborhood that I should look in. I need you to tell me the price range that I should look in. And I, I, I need you to, to tell me the type of roofing. I remember the Holy Ghost prick, prick me now. I remember when Pastor Grizzle testified and Pastor Grizzle said that he did not know how to make furniture. And that man was just so willing to say, God, teach me I need to, 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 to find food for my family. And God was able to say, look here, this is how you cut the wood. This is how you glue it up. This is what you do. And the man became an expert at furniture making. God even telling the type of wood that he should choose to do the work. So, and I said it, that God is concerned about the minutest of things in our life. But we have got to be willing, we have got to be committed to do whatever it is that God said that we must do. We should not go with God, with, 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 with our minds made up. This is how we want you to operate, Lord. Just stamp this thing so that I might be in your will. Many times we fail to find the will of God for our life because we are not willing to accept and to do what he tells us to do. As I, as I read here, the, the, the rich young ruler came to mind. The Bible says that the will of God is that none should perish. The rich young ruler came to mind and he came to Jesus and said, Master, what shall I do? Jesus said, sell these things. But he was not willing to do what the master told him to do. When we go to God to say, Lord, show me your will, direct me. Are we willing to do what God wants us to do, or is it that we are trying to satisfy our consciences to say, Lord, at least I come before you and I mention the situation. So Abraham knew the will of God, that nations and kings were going to come out of his lines, and that he would be the father of many nations. However, as it pertains to going in unto Agar, Abraham did not talk to God and say, God, what would you have me to do? Here's what my wife is saying. What would you have me to do? But when I look at the life of David, David is known as a man after God's own heart. And he was not without mistakes. He was not without stepping outside of God's will. However, his life was characterized by him frequently seeking the Lord's counsel and direction. Whenever David was faced with any form of situation, especially when it comes to his enemies, he always spent the time to seek the Lord. He always spent the time to ask, God, what would you have me to do? Anytime David was in a situation, Lord, what is your will? 
And each time he inquired, the Lord graciously gave him a clear and definite answer. I want to tell us that if we are interested in finding God's perfect will for how we operate on our day-to-day -day basis, the route that we travel to work, because you know the Holy Ghost can convict you and say, travel this road to work just to save you from an accident. So as it pertains to our entire life, the minutest of things, we need to say, Lord, I need you to tell me what it is that you want me to do. So David, each time he inquired of the Lord, the Lord graciously gave him a clear and definite answer. I want you to know that if you spend the time to seek the Lord, about your life, about his will for your life, about his will for your life as it pertains to ministry, his will as it pertains to a husband or a wife, his will as it pertains to a career, as it pertains to schooling, as it pertains to a business. God will give you an answer. When we look at the many times that David spent seeking the will of God, we get an understanding. And it teaches us that we gain by seeking his counsel and by doing his will. When we look at the passage, we want to look at the passage in 1 Samuel 23. One to three. And we'll be looking at a couple of them. The others I will give you just that you could, could add to your notes that you are making. So first Samuel 23, one to three. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more than if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? David's predicament here was that David was hiding from Saul. But then the Philistine came and they attacked the stronghold of the Israelites. Saul was king, but Saul was not concerned about this. Saul's concern was to catch David. But David had a burden and David sought the Lord and said, Lord, should I go down there to deliver Kila? And the Lord says, go. But the men, these strong men, these men there that were with David, said, we are here in Judah and we are afraid. Oh, much more to go down to Kila. We're, because what they were saying, you know, if we go down to Keilah, we are going to have to be fighting now the Philistines. And then at the same time, Saul might come upon us. So that was what they are really saying. David considered himself Israel's protector. And David loved his country and desired to free it from the enemies. Yet, he would not act without first seeking the Lord's counsel. I want us to know that when we look over the life of David, though he made some mistakes on many occasions, David spent the time to find the mind and to find the will of God as it pertains to going against his enemy. 
So the Lord said to him, go attack the Philistine and save Keilah. The Lord responded immediately to David's inquiry and promised David that he would save Keilah. But the 600 men said to him, we are afraid. This presented a real problem for David. If his men were unwilling to go to follow him, how could he save the city? His men were afraid of being caught between the Philistines and Saul's army. Unlike David, their eyes were not on the Lord. David added again in 1 Samuel 23, verse 4 and 5. David again inquired of the Lord a second time. The Bible says, then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistine into thine hand. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. So David knew after inquiring of God that God would be with him. And God said to him the second time, Go, you shall deliver that city. And David went. So David and his man went to Keilah and fought and delivered the city from the Philistine. The Lord did not ignore. This was the same situation. And the Lord did not ignore David. Inquiry the second time. David heard from the Lord the first time, go up. In his mind, he was saying, God, you tell me to go up. But these 600 men here with me, they said, no, they're not willing to go up. They're afraid. So David, in order to make sure that he heard from God, went to God a second time. And this second time, the Lord said to him, go, I will deliver them into your hands and you shall free the city. And David went with the 600 men and delivered the city. He inquired of the Lord and he delivered the city. 1 Samuel 23, 10 and 11. Same passage now, we know. David. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant have certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my name, for my sake. So David delivered the city from the Philistines. And now it was told Saul that. David Keilat, and Keilat was a fence city, it was a city with gate. And when Saul heard this, Saul said, look here, he round up the troops, and he said, I'm going to go to Keilat because this is a fence city, he can't escape now. But David heard it, and he again inquired of the Lord. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hands? Will Saul come down as thy servant had heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant, and the Lord said, he will come down. You know what? David don't want to hear nothing more than that. He will come down. Look here. Suppose it was that David was not willing to seek the will of God, to find the mind of God. He could have been relaxing in the city. 
And Saul came and surrounded the city. Not that God could not deliver him. But it goes to show that when we spend the time to find the mind of God. Remember we started out with the scripture and the Bible said no. Years shall be added unto you if you walk in the will of God. So look at the story. If he did not find the will of God, he could have still been in the city. But the man had a heart that was, he was always willing to seek the mind and to find the will of God. Look, let's look at 1 Samuel 30, 8 and 9. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, So here it was that David was running from Saul, and he went into a Philistine country, in the Philistine country, into a city called Ziklag. And David was now willing to fight against the armies of Israel. He went out and he lined himself with them. And one of the kings said, Is not this that David, that it was said of, he slew his 10,000? And they said, No, we will not carry him to fight with us, lest he turn on us in, in the battle. So they told David to, to go home. When he went home to the city of Ziklag, the Amalekites invaded the city. They took everything, burned down the building, took his wife, took his children. And when they came home, the Bible said that David was weak. Felt like his spirit left him. But in his weakness, in this overwhelming situation, David now inquired again of the Lord. The Bible says, And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without failure recover all. Being reassured by the Lord, David overtake. The Bible says David went, he and the 600 men that were with him, and came to the brook Bezor, where those that were left behind stayed. But David pursued he and 400 men, for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over Brook Bizar. And they found the Egyptian in the field and brought him to David and gave him bread. And he did eat and they made him drink. The, the, the end of the story is that they told David where the people were. And David went and he recovered all according to the word of the Lord. In 2 Samuel 2, 1 to 2, David again, I will not read this one, but you can read it in your spare time. David again sought the Lord, and the Lord heard him. In 2 Samuel 2, 5, 17 to 21, David again sought the Lord. And again the Lord heard him. In 2 Samuel 5, 22 to 25, again he sought the Lord. And in 2 Samuel 21 and 1, there was a famine in the land for three years. And David inquired of the Lord 
and the Lord answered it. I am saying to us that as it pertains to the will of God, when it comes to finding and abiding in the will of God, the first point that we made here was that we are going to have to seek to know the will of God. And David in all these scriptures, not that he's without fault, but he spent the time to find the mind of God, spend the time to know the will of God. And on all of the occasions, the Bible did say that God answered. I am saying to us that if we spend the time to seek, God will answer. David, multiples, multiple inquiry of the Lord, revealed that he was a man of prayer, who was always intent to know God's will. And I want to, I want us to find tonight Acts 13, and we're going to close with this scripture. Acts 13, verses 22. This was the main reason why David was called a man after God's own heart. Acts 13, 22. And when he had removed him, raised up unto them David to be their king. To whom also he gave the testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my what? All my will. This was the reason why David was considered was called a man after God's own heart because David was willing to do all God's will. I want to be considered a man after God's own heart. I have a fear that I operate with and this fear is to make sure that I am in the will of God. I am telling us brothers and sisters it might look like a small thing but when it comes to God he wants us to find and he wants us to operate in his perfect will. Abraham, the Bible said, was a friend of God and I mentioned it. But yet, he took counsel from his wife and went in unto his handmaid. I want God to give me a spirit. I want God to give me a conviction like David's conviction that I might be able to seek the Lord and to know his will for my every move. God bless you tonight in Jesus' name. As I close tonight in prayer, I ask us to bow our heads one more time as I pray. Lord, we again come to you and we thank you, God, for what was said. We thank you for your words. Yes, Lord, your will is important and it's important for us as your people to abide in your perfect will. God, you have a plan for our lives. You said, I know the thought that I think towards you. This plan is your will for us. We pray, God, that as individuals, we pray, God, that as a church, as a people called by your name, we will find and we will abide in your will. It is how you will bring the blessing. It is how you will give a listening ear to our prayers. We give you thanks tonight for hearing. We ask God that you will even touch that unsaved heart right now that is tuning in. We ask God that you will grant repentance, that you will convict. Great Jesus, your divine will is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we pray that you'll bring that souls, our souls to repentance, that they will come to know you for whom to know is to have life eternal. We thank you for hearing tonight. We thank you for answering. As we bless your great name. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you tonight. We thank you for tuning in. And we will pick up where we left off. Where we leave off this week. And hopefully next week. God willing. God tarry. Same time. Same place. We will be here. And we will share 
another. We'll continue this thought and we will share with us. God bless you tonight in Jesus' name.